Will you all please stand for our theme song?
remain standing as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that's really all we can say. We are just so in awe of you. Lord, and just, we love you. Lord, please be with us as we continue to go through this week of prayer. Lord, guide our hearts and just help us to see what you want us to. Amen. we're going to be singing is Whom Shall I Fear? And it kind of speaks to me, so I chose it. Um, there's no one else that should be feared but God. And um, a lot of times we, the devil brings fear in our life. And God, God's ultimate choice for us is to not be afraid, but to believe in him and trust in him. So whom shall I fear?
Thank you, guys. Beautiful. I didn't think about telling you about my family till after last night on my way home, Cherokee Valley Road, and I creamed a rabbit. And I'm like, my daughter's going to kill me. Um, my daughter's 12, and my son is 15. He is in eighth grade, and he'll be going into academy next year. And I hope you'll be able to meet them on Friday night. I've been telling them, I want you guys to come. But I have a speaking appointment on Sabbath up in Cedar Ridge. And so they originally were going to go with me there. Um, and my wife's like, I'm not sure. It's going to be really late. And so we go. And then this afternoon, my daughter came home. And she's like, Dad, I really, really want to go to Sabbath school. I haven't been to Sabbath. I missed last week. And I really want to go to Sabbath school in College Hill Church. Can we, can we please just go with you Friday night? I'm like, anybody begging me to go to Sabbath school? You're going with me Friday night. That's a good thing. So that's okay. So I hope they'll be here Friday night. Are we doing, did I understand we're doing an agape feast Friday night? Is that? Communion. Okay. Excellent. It's all right. What, did I miss something? Agape feast, communion. It's the same thing, right? No? Agape feast is usually what? The tables and the bread and emblem and stuff. Great. I look forward to that with you. All right. One piece of business I forgot last night before we get into it tonight. Um, a practical step when it comes to studying the Bible. First and foremost, if you can find three or four people to study with, that is the best. If you can find guys in the dorm, get a couple of guys. Set a time once a week. Start small. Pick a book, First John, James. If you want to go heavy right away, get into the prison epistles. Start with... Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'd probably start with Ephesians. Um, and just go verse by verse. You, you, if you want a Strong's, that's great. If you want to have a concordance or something, that's fine too. But I find some of the most powerful Bible studies happen when, when just three or four or five or six, it can be up to 12. I'm over small groups in College Hill Church. I've loved small groups forever, and I've done studies in small groups. Once you get past 12 people, it turns crazy, all right? It turns a totally different dynamic. But if you can have up to 10 to 12 people, take a text, have somebody that leads out. If there's just three or four of you, it's not really a big deal. But just say, we're not moving on the next text until we understand what this text tells us about God, what this text tells us about, tells me about me, and then how can I apply what I found in this text to my life? You take an hour with several of you and you go through a passage or a chapter, you will walk away with a high, with a natural high, a spiritual high. And the next day, the Holy Spirit will be playing that through your mind. Just be consistent with it as far as a personal devotional time goes I told somebody this evening if you're not into the personal devotion thing start small three minutes literally set your watch I'm going to pray for three minutes set your watch if you run out of stuff in two minutes there's a problem but you should be able to get through three minutes get through three minutes and then the next day up it to four minutes the next day five minutes you won't believe it by the time it goes by, you can be praying a half an hour, 45 minutes, talking to God like a friend, and it will seem like your time has gone just like that. Start small. Take yourself two or three verses. Find a time early in the morning, late at night, depending if you're a night owl or any morning person. But just start small. See what happens. Partner with God on that. And watch what he'll do as that habit grows. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come into your presence tonight. You have promised to be here. You have promised, Lord, that your word will go forth and it will not return to you empty. I hold on to that promise tonight. Lord, I ask that this place would again be surrounded by angels that excel in strength. I ask that every force of darkness that may be here tonight be silenced in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you will open our eyes to see you and to reach for the freedom that you hold out to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
we were in the middle of a Bible study. It was around 2006. My family, we had just moved to the island of Palau in Micronesia. I was going to be district pastor there. I had a really dream churches. I had one that was in the city of Koror, which was actually on another island. We had to go across a really long bridge to get there. But then I had another little church that was about an hour away by boat. The church had this incredible 25-foot boat with two 200 outboards, and I had the terrible problem of every four weeks having to go out through crystal clear water, weaving through the islands out to a to a little, the little island of Peleliu. Anybody World War II enthusiasts here? Ever heard of Peleliu? Major battle on Peleliu. We have on Palau, there was about 20 student missionaries. I plug something here for my wife. My wife, we've been married 19 years in May. She's an incredible trooper. I am madly in love with her. Grows every day. I almost lost her in Thailand, 1997, down in the southern part of Thailand, where we had gone down for a vacation and were staying in a small hotel. Um, she got some type of bug where we just were going out on a boat trip all day for about 10 hours, and she got sick right at the beginning. And it was so bad, by the time we got back, she was so sick that I literally had to carry her. She could not walk from the boat to the hotel. She was three days in and out of consciousness. We didn't, you don't go to local clinics when you're in those type of places. Um, and I just prayed my way as I would drag her until her fever got so high, I would drag her into the shower. I love her, she's an incredible trooper. I hope, hope you get to meet her on, on Friday night. Um, she's in charge of student missionaries at Southern Adventist University sends out 70 student missionaries a year. And it's fun because we get to plug these places that we've lived, whether it's Thailand or whether it's Palau. And in Palau at that time when we were there, there were 20 SMs that were teaching in the high school and the elementary school, take 10 months off, go out there, wonderful experience. And, and, and it would be every couple of weeks we'd have them come to our house on Friday night and we would have a great Bible study. We'd all gather in our living room and we were in the middle of a study of very similar of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Sin equals bondage. And I can still remember, and I won't tell you his name, and he was sitting across over on a couch and as we're getting through and we're talking about bondage and we're talking about temptation and, and how messing with sin can lock you into sin to where you want to step away from it and you cannot step away from it. And we got to the middle and we started talking about some different things and we got into music and we were talking about, you know, and some people were saying, yeah, well, there's, this music doesn't really affect me and this or that. And, and he looked right at me and he's like, you know what? I listen to all kinds of music. And he says, it's no big deal. He says, I can give it up at any time if I wanted to. And I looked back at him and I said, then why don't you? If you know what we've been talking about here and we know some of the stuff that you've been listening to is, is directly from the hand of the devil. You can look at the lyrics. You can look at the people's lives that sing it. Why don't you? And he's like, fine. No big deal. No problem. So a couple of days later, I was getting ready to leave to go into the office in Karoor and I heard boom, boom, boom on the front door. And I opened it up and there he stood. I can still remember him quiet for a second, and he said, I can't stop. I need help. Come in. Came in, we sat down and started talking. The story begins to unfold. His parents divorced at 15. He said he was so angry at the divorce that the only way he could find rest for his brain to not think about it was through what he called rage music. And so he started loading up the CDs. And every time he would get frustrated, he would get home from classes. And he was in another one of our boarding schools in the southern area here. And every time he would get back and he'd be frustrated about something during the day, he would go in, he would put in his favorite Led Zeppelin or whatever it was, and he would, Def Leppard, he would start listening and he says it wasn't long before he was just in sync with the music. And the rage, he said, was able to just, it would get so hard and so heavy in his mind, but he was able to diffuse it until the next time. 
he needed the fix. And as we sat there in the living room, he said, I have tried for three days. I have tried to not listen to it when I went back after teaching my classes. He said, it freaked me out so bad last night that I knew I had to come to you today. He says, I walked into the apartment. I, I said, I'm not going to listen to it. And he says that he, his body literally, as he walked over to the CD cases, he opened up the CD, even though his brain was telling him, I'm not going to do this, I'm not doing this. And he took the CD out and he slipped it in and the room became filled with music. And he's like, it scared me because I cannot stop. Mm, long story, but we're sitting in the church. He had brought his, his cases. And guys, when, when he started spreading out his CD cases onto the table, I realized there's thousands of dollars worth of CDs here. There was a whole section of cases that were movies. And he pushed those over and he says, I can't touch those. Those are my dad's. He says, I'm going to send them back to him. He sent them to me when I was here. But he had cases of music. And as he was going through... He was breaking them with his hands or he was taking a pair of scissors and cutting through them until he came to one CD that was a Def Leppard CD and he pulled it out. I don't even remember the name of the, the album, but it had on the front, it had an eyeball inside of a safe where you open up a safe. And he took the CD and he slid it across the table and he said, that's me. That's me. This stuff is locked up in me and I want it gone. We broke every CD, put them in this box. My kids were little at the time, standing out in the back overlooking the islands of Palau where the, where the, the house was sitting up on the hill and we started a fire and he began to dump that until it was a plastic molten mess in the backyard. But he walked away that day free. And if I had him standing up here today, he would tell you there is a way to be free. The problem with sin is that when you start messing with it, it pulls you in and you think it's no big deal and yeah, it's forbidden and yeah, mom says and dad says and blah, 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 the adults say and they, whatever, and you start to dabble with it until the problem is, is that as I've studied this, what I realize is, is that that sin becomes a chain that actually chains you to the devil. But the devil always leaves enough loose so that you think that you can go away anytime you want. And he lets you, like a dog, run around and have that chain loose. And you think everything is fine until the moment you want to leave. And when you want to leave, you suddenly get to the end and you realize, Gunk. there's a chain. There's a chain. I know I want to stop. I know I don't want to do this anymore. But you can't stop how I was able to help that student missionary because that was my story. I had walked that through high school. I had walked it all the way through, through the, the experience of Thailand, which I'm going to tell you tomorrow night, was a turning point in my life where God reached down to me and he said, Ken, I want you. I want you with your chains. I love you and I want you to come to me. I had walked that path until, in my own experience, I was begging one night, begging God, please take this thing from me. I don't want it anymore. I want it gone. It had been years. And even though I'd been slowly walking towards him, I could not stop. And that night I had a dream. One of the most vivid dreams. Seeing myself participating in this sin as this black statue in the middle of a forest. And I watched in that dream as that statue fell over and broke in the forest. And I could still remember in the dream I started running because there was a whole swarm of bees that were chasing me. And I ran and I climbed inside this log and the bees were swirling out there and they were buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And then I woke up and I knew, I knew clearly that moment that he had taken it. That was 20 years ago. I've never stepped 
never stepped back into that sin since. The bees representing the devil is not going to like you trying to walk away. And he will attack. But there is freedom. I walk you through tonight my own journey of how to find that freedom. I know there's some of you here that could care less. There's some of you that are here because you have to be here. I know that there's some of you here whose hearts are reaching out to say, I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to be free. I want him to speak to you tonight. I want to be very clear about something before we hit a couple of texts quickly in a row. Extremely clear. The Bible clearly defines the kind of attitude and action towards sin that leads to bondage and constant harassment by Satan. Okay? It was in a later study as I started to try to understand what is sin because I recognize I fall. I recognize there's, I, I want to do what's right and I do stupid things. I say stupid things or the carnal nature comes up again and I fall into sin. But as I started to study scripture, I realized how come these people that, that we experienced in, in the occurrences of demonic possession at Southern, there were four of them over a period of, year, uh, of the year. And we get to the end of the year and as I realize, as I look back at their experiences, not one of them had been involved in the occult or in Satanism. Every single one of them had gotten to the point where they're writhing on the floor because of sin. And I started to say, why, why did this not happen to me? I, I was chained and the, the Lord began to un, uh, unroll in my mind the difference. And I want that difference to be very clear here this morning. There's a word that pops out when you start to study about sin in Scripture. And it's something I want you to see. And I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Because this word pops out over and over. And I think that it does that so that God lets us know the difference of attitude towards sin. That makes the difference between the warfare that's going on around you. That's going on in your heart. There's a, there's a huge difference here. Galatians chapter 5. One of my favorite passages, actually, over the past probably two years of trying to understand more of this battle with pleasure and walking in the spirit. Why does it seem like the carnal is still so strong when, when I've given my heart to God and I want to walk with him? How can I say no? It's, it's been my own spiritual journey in the, in the past couple of years here, but I want to skip down to something. We're going to talk a little bit more about verse 16 and all of that tomorrow night. But I want to hit here, um, starting in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. I will just stop here to say, I don't think it's coincidence that the fir first four of the works of the flesh have to do with sexual things. Okay. I can't go that bunny trail. I was going to run a bunny trail there, and I can't do that because there's a whole topic on that. Uh, I will only say that I recognize with a 15-year-old son the difference today as when I was in high school. In high school, to access porn, you had to go and you had to buy a magazine. And none of us would do that because we wouldn't get caught in some convenience store where your dad's a you know, a principal of an academy in which he was or whatever. He, there's, there's a pride factor. There's all that. Now you don't. Now you pull out your phone. The way the devil has shaped all these tools that, yes, God can use these tools, but he's using these things to destroy us. Unless you are equipped with understanding how to have those, and I... And I and, Girls, you can close your ears, whatever. I guess speak to the guys for a moment. But unless you guys learn to navigate through this period, which is a period of basically age 13 to 25, where you've got to deal with all this energy going on, and you know what I'm talking about, unless you learn how to deal with that, it will either run the rest of your life or it will ruin the rest of your life. You, you, you have to address it. You can't not address it. It is a challenge today. It is a challenge that is greater today than it was when the adults in this room were dealing with these 
the first four. Then he goes into idolatry and sorcery, verse 20. Hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like. Listen to this. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, here it is, that those who, what's the next word? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the word that starts bouncing out in Scripture that helped me to understand my own relationship with God and how to understand this. It's the word practice. Practice means intentional. I want to do this. I'm going to do this. And, and shut up about it. I don't want to hear about it. That's a totally different attitude than other places in Scripture where we find godly men and women all the way through. You look at the disciples, you look at Peter staying there denying his Lord. Did he plan to do that? No. But he fell. That's the t- difference that sin holds up in Scripture. You find it all the way through. I, don't look this up. I'm going to quickly read it to you. Matthew 13, 41 to 42. The Son of Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Revelation 22, 15. But outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You've got to catch this, guys. Practicing is different from slipping and falling. It's totally different. Practicing means not desiring forgiveness. It means you're consciously living in rebellion. And it's an I don't care attitude. I don't care. And it's living that. We all have those moments where we don't care. It's, it's part of our spiritual journey. But this is, this is an attitude and a lifestyle. But what happens is, please go here, John chapter 8. What happens is Jesus tells very clearly what happens with those of us who practice lawlessness. You can have everything right You can go to church, you can pay your tithe, you can do all the right things, you can put on a face for everybody. And if there is one part of your life that you say, this is mine, even though it is forbidden and it's hurting me, or it may be hurting other people, and don't believe the lie that it doesn't hurt you and it only belongs to you. Those are lies. They're lies. If you have one spot that you hold dear to yourself, it will unravel you. And Jesus understood that. This is one of my favorite passages. John chapter 8, 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. here, Here it connects into last night. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then they answered him, well, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered, listen, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits, another word for practices, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. The angel to Mary. You shall call his name Yeshua, Savior, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You shall know the truth, Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. Here's where it's practical. First, Jesus wants to set you free from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. She always sat, this was just like the Koror church, 
She always sat back in that corner every night after the evangelistic series. I would preach, I would walk down to walk out, and I would look over and glance to the side, and I would see her sitting there, and her head would always be down like this. You couldn't see her face. She would just be sitting like this. Night after night, she kept coming back. One morning I had a knock on my door and the secretary says, there's a, there's a lady here to see you. She's been coming to the meetings. Can you see her now? I said, sure. Before the secretary could even back up, here comes Eileen through the door. As she walked past me into my office to sit down in the chair, I finally had a good look at her face. She had scars all the way across her forehead. Deep scars and across her chin where somebody it looked like had taken a machete maybe when she was a child and just chopped her right across the head all the way across she sat down in the chair she was quiet I pulled up the chair took my Bible and I just waited quietly and Eileen whispered and said Pastor, I said, yes. Does God really love me? Yes, Eileen. He does love you. It was quiet. Pastor, yes. Does God really love me? Yes, Eileen, he does love you. Pastor, yes? Does God love me? Does he really love me? Me, does he love me? Yes, Eileen, he really loves you. Into my mind came 1 John chapter 4. As I'm flipping through, she starts to cry. We get to 1 John chapter 4. And the Lord impressed me at that moment to put her name in the text. And I started to read to her and I said, Eileen, the Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifested toward you. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that you might live through Him. And this is love. Not that you love God, but that he loved you, Eileen, and he sent his son to be the propitiation, to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. Eileen, do you believe this? She was quiet as she cried, and I'll never forget her. Looking up at me with the tears rolling down her face and saying, Yes. As she cracked a smile a little bit, yes. I do. I believe it. There is no greater privilege for a pastor or a worker or anybody who studies with anybody else to see that person come through to baptism. I will never, ever forget her baptism. Because there were many that were baptized from the meetings and, and the place, we had a baptistry in the church, but we decided because there's so many, we're going to go down to one of the harbors. And we got down where the bridge went over from our island to their island. And there was, a, there was a harbor where people would swim. The water was crystal clear. I can still remember going down in there with the Palauan pastor over there, baptizing them by twos until it was Eileen's turn. And I made sure I had Eileen down and she came into the water and stood next to me. I will never forget this moment because it was exactly like... It was like the movie Nemo where those fish, you know, those fish all go into a, to a, you know, a little thing and they're pointing the direction. Guys, there was a swarm, a swarm, there was a school of fish that came into the harbor. I am not kidding. 
There were millions of them, little tiny silver fish. And you could see the black cloud as they were coming in during the baptism. And standing there with Eileen and feeling these fish come in, you could literally, all of a sudden they're just boom, right by you. You could feel them whizzing by. And I remember her going down into the water and watching the fish, just like the Nemo thing, going right around her head, just going whoop, whoop, right around her head and coming up out of the water and seeing her face wet those scars, troughs filled with water, but her face was beaming. And I knew Jesus had found the home in her heart. This is, this is a funny side note, but I really do believe one day and I get to heaven and I'm going to walk in the gate and there's going to be a group of angels come up there and they're going to be like, hey. And they're like, hey guys. And they're like, remember us? No, you don't. They're going to be like, we were those fish, man. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> I, I think something like that's going to happen. I really was a God thing. Really was. But listen, Eileen, Eileen figured out what started her on the path to freedom. What started her was recognizing that Jesus Christ already paid the penalty for her sin. He had freed her from that penalty. That releases you to realize when the baggage of the past whatever your past may be, and it does not matter. I could fill up the rest of the time. Oh, my. I could fill up the rest of the time. I only got five minutes. I could fill up the rest of the time telling you stories of people, people who were really, really had lives. One of those, those testimonies where they've done everything and coming back to God and God, and them telling the story of saying, God forgave me, and all of that is gone. He takes me where I am now and, and he's moved me forward. It doesn't matter. Don't believe the lie. When the devil comes and tells you, you are a piece of scum. Look at you calling yourself a Christian and you can't quit that. You're doing that. You're listening. You're watching. Blah, 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 blah. You hear it all the time. It rumbles through your head. And you know what I've, got, I've finally come to say? When he comes and he says, you are a piece of trash. I just say, you're right. I am. But I am bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. I am his son, and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get away from me. I do not want to hear your noise because it's lies. The penalty has been paid. Oh, running out of time. Romans, Romans chapter 8. You know this verse. You know this verse. Verse, no, Romans 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, we were still sinners. There was nobody at the cross. Nobody. He didn't care. He was still willing to die for eternity if he had to to give us a chance to buy our freedom so therefore chapter 5 verse 1 says we've been just if, if you believe you've been justified by faith you've been made right with God because you say I believe that you died for me the penalty is gone he's carried the penalty okay got to save that part for tomorrow night second Jesus wants to free you from the power of sin he first wants to free you from the penalty. He wants to free you from the power. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. This is where it gets extremely practical. The whole piece about the, pen, the, the penalty part is stuff you sit in class and you listen to. And yeah, I believe Jesus died for me. And really, we do. We believe that. But it doesn't seem to have sometimes a really practical application. You don't feel anything. There's not... It's, it's a faith journey when it comes to the penalty part. But it becomes very real when it comes to the power part. Because that has to do with practical, everyday walking. Okay, quick story. I was on my way home from Karor. I can still remember the corner. Because I, there's a corner in the road that goes around between the two islands. When I started to pull up to that corner, I could literally feel the pull inside of me. Back into an area that I had closed in my own life as forbidden pleasure. 
You may think it's silly when I tell you what the forbidden pleasure was, but I'm going to tell you, I don't care. When I was through, through high school, and I know it was different than it is today, I know Halo and World of Warcraft, and I know all these things, okay, I know the whole gaming thing, Call of Duty, blah, blah, blah. I got a 15-year-old, I understand he talks about it, and they talk about it at school and all that, but gaming was my thing. And when I went, the night before, I was up in the, the church cafeteria. We had brought some Chinese students. We had invited them to come to our academy. And they were great kids. I really enjoyed it. But they came from a background that knew nothing about God. Nothing. And their parents were high up in the government in China. And they were coming. And it was incredible. Because, long story short, we actually baptized many of them. And several of them are still at Southern right now. Wonderful things that happened. But I, as I came into the cafeteria, they were all sitting, had their computers open, all connected, and they were in the middle of a gaming session. And I remember walking around, and one of them was saying, oh, Pastor Ken, please come play with us. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. I said, no. I'm not. I, you know, because I felt, I felt at that moment, I felt the pull. I felt the pull. And I said, no, I'm not. And I said, thanks, guys. You know, On coming home the next night, I felt, and I could hear it, go. Go to the cafeteria. You know they're going to be there. Go. And that was an area that I had chosen to shut off because it was messing with me and messing with my, my relationship with God. But the pull became so strong that it just did not go away. I felt it. Drive past your home. Go straight to the cafeteria and play. And literally driving my little van, I'm, I started to smack down saying No. No. And the more I said no, the stronger, it, the stronger the pull came. Until it was so strong, it's literally pushing tears out of my eyes. No, I will not go. And that scared me. It scared me to realize there's this engine right here that is so desirous of forbidden pleasure the sin engine that is only divine miracles when we can say no. And by God's grace, that night I said no. But it was, it was because, because of the pathway of, of realizing that God says, when you feel that pull and you feel it coming from a mile away and I know you know what I'm talking about. You, you can be doing something totally different and you can feel it coming. It's coming to pull me. And you ignore it and it comes. He has promised that when you call out to him, he will give you the power to say no. And that's not my words. Those are his words. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 quickly. Romans 6, 7, and 8. One of the most powerful passages in scripture. 6 and 8. Sandwich. Paul's struggle in the middle as a human being. I believe his struggle as he de delineates it there is who he says he is by himself. Who am I by myself? I do, I, I'm just trapped. I do all the stuff I don't want to do. And I, I, then you get six and eight, which give the secrets of how to, how to be released out of that life. Does that make sense? Six, he's very clear. He says in verse six, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Listen, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And he, he's kind of trying to compare it to us in baptism. You commit yourself to Christ, then die to that stuff. Die to the stuff that's going to hurt you and hurt other people and live to God. But listen, I love this. Likewise, you also, verse 11, reckon, consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin, what's the word? Reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Why on earth is he going to tell you that if there's not a way to do it? There's a way to do it. 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in, your, in its lust. Verse 16, he repeats what Jesus had already said. Don't you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves you obey? Whether to sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But now, verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. And then he couch, he, he puts the bookend on it, which we say all the time since we were in crater roll role or whatever. But here it is in context. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Galatians 1.4 says, He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And he will do it. He will do it. He wants to free you from the penalty of sin. He wants to free you from the power of sin. We're going to talk a little bit more about the power of peace tomorrow night. And lastly, he wants to free you from the presence of sin. I can't wait. Monks move into monasteries to try to get away from temptation. But guess what follows them there? An evil heart. You can't run from this engine of sin inside of you. Jesus Christ waits he is longing for the day when he will be able to rip that engine out. The Bible says in the blink of an eye, you will be changed. Mortal will put on immortality and it will be gone. And you will not have to wrestle with temptation and sin anymore. This is the not yet. The penalty can happen now. The power, freedom from power of sin can happen now. The presence of sin has not happened yet, but it will take place. It will take place. It's not my promise. It's His. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, Revelation 21.3, close with this tonight. I learned, heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Oh, whole nother sermon. That's his greatest desire. To be with you. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, no more pain. The former things have passed away that have to do with sin. Then behold, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, including you. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and they are true. We often stop there, but he finishes with his own appeal to us, which is my appeal to you tonight. And in verse 6 it says, He said to me, It is finished, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. You can overcome. He is your God. You are his sons and daughters. He paid the penalty. His divine power is freely available now. And he can't wait to save you from the presence of sin. Close your eyes, bow your heads, please. If there's anybody here tonight, everybody, it's eyes closed. You, this is between you and God. You want to reach your hand to heaven to say, God, I want all of these. 
real in my life, saved from the penalty. I, I want your help to save me from the power of sin. Lord, I want to be ready for you to save me from the presence of sin. If that's your prayer, raise your hand. God sees it. Lord Jesus, you're not looking down from heaven. You are here with us tonight. Lord Jesus, you see the hands. You know every heart. Lord God, do in the hearts that are reaching out for you, do what only you can do, Lord. Bring your gentle love, your wrapping arms, Jesus, your divine power. I pray for my friends tonight who desire to have all of you. Lord Jesus, you have already been reaching to us. Your hand has already been down. We simply grab hold of it now. Help us, Lord, we ask. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the, the challenges, some of the bonds that have been holding you back. Um, I encourage you guys to open up your Bibles and read with somebody. And Pastor Ken will be up here if anybody wants to come and talk to him for a little bit. We'll see you tomorrow night. You guys have a great evening.